start with the strawberry and crackers. Well, we do have a very good climate for this important disease of strawberries, right? It's one of the major fungal diseases that drive the need for fungus applications. Uh, now, the, what causes the disease are Okay. Are the um, you know are called Colchicans species, and those are fungal, uh, those are fungi, and particularly Colchicans species. Um, there are two different kinds of Colchicans species: Colchicans acutatum. Now, the cause of the disease, Colchicans acutatum and Colchicans galoidospiritis, right? That's what we used to call them. And now the scientists uh, figured out that. Each of the two species actually is a species complex, which means that there are more species, there are multiple species under each complex. Uh, I will get to that later. Um, now, as I mentioned before, it's a warm and a wet disease, and which you know our, our climate is very favorable for this disease, disease development, disease infection. And with regard to the symptoms, if you look at the picture on the right. Um, it, it causes sunken leaching on the fruit tissue, and sometimes you can see the bright orange spar leaching on developing on the uh, on the fruit, and where so hundreds, thousands, millions of um, chlamydia are being produced, and it causes more infections during the same season. So, it, this disease uh, typically, um, you know, is a is a sh it shows up later in the season when the sugar level rises, but it could also show up earlier in the season at the green berry stage. You can see the picture upper left, the green berry uh, that had the, the infection uh, of anthracolos, especially you know, if you grow highly susceptible cultivars under more favorable uh, weather condition and the disease could show up early, right? although it's, it typically show up later in the season during ripening. Now, where does it come from, and how um, and how um, how it spreads? Um, the chlamydia of Colchicans species uh, are again they're produced on host tissue, and they are water dispersal pathogen, which means they don't typically travel for long distance. Okay, and possible sources of infection, nursery transplants, are typically considered the primary um, source of inoculum for the disease. Okay, and because you know the, the species they have both biotrophic and um, lacotrophic stages, and then the, the symptoms they don't show up for some time due to this um, biotrophic process, which typically occur during the early part of the infection, and that's why it typically show up later in the season. Um, but the problem is that when you have a tr transplant, perfectly fine, right? Soon, soon after planting, under the right conditions, the disease start to show up, and that's uh, very frustrating. Now, uh, other po possible sources of in, uh, infection, uh, including weeds, and the 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 fungi can also live in weeds as endophyte, and they, they can also, you know, uh, stay uh, in weeds, but without really causing any issues on weeds. They're asymptomatic, okay? Um, and there have been a few studies that showed certain herbicide could stimulate the sporulation. If you don't bother weeds, then they won't bother you. But you, if you try to kill them, you might stimulate the sporulation of cortotrican, which could serve as a source of inoculum for strawberry anthracolos. Um, now, survival in the soil, I mean, it's typically the, the pathogen is not a, a soil-borne pathogen. But studies have shown that it could survive, soil for quite, uh, survive in soil for quite some time, especially under drier conditions, okay? So, putting together the life cycle of the disease, again, the transplants are considered the primary source of inoculant. And under optimal weather conditions, this the disease start to show up and produce spores and, core and cause more infections during the same season. And again, uh, nearby weeds uh, that host uh, the pathogen uh, 
as well as the you know other crops such as peppers. You know, pepper also have the same disease, anthracnose, right? And caused by the same pathogen, infected. Uh, let's say peppers nearby your field, strawberry field, could also um, uh, serve as inoculum uh, for the for the disease on strawberries. So a couple years ago, we did a um, survey to uh, find out what are the species responsible for strawberry anthracnose in our region. As I mentioned before, there are there could be multiple species that cause the disease, right? But really, what what are the species we have in our region? And we collected uh, a total of 200, 200 fungal isolates from strawberries, you know, in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and the Lost Carolina. And you can say the majority of the isolates turn out to be Cototrichin nymphaeae, and that's one species under Cototrichin acutatum complex. Okay, and the other one that we found under the same complex was Cototrichin fayolaneae, and but um, there were just much less. Uh, and with regard to the other Cototrichin, I mean complex. Cototrichin gallodiosporides, we found Cototrichin siomensi under that specific, you know, complex. Um, there were a total of 12 isolates. Again, you can say the majority uh, being Cototrichin nymphaeae, very specifically, okay? And um, if you look at this uh, diagram below, from the fruit, we got samples from different host tissues, including fruit, crown, as well as stem and runners. From the fruit, 95% of isolates were Cototrichin nymphaeae, and 5% were Cototrichin fayolaneae. And from the crown, about half of those were Cototrichin nymphaeae, while the other half were um, Cototrichin siomensae. And we do have one, just one isolate, uh, Cototrichin nymphaeae, that does not belong to any of the two uh, complexes. From stem and runner, 100% Cototrichin nymphaeae, right? Uh, okay, continue, and they do look different when they were growing on artificial media in the lab. Cototrichin nymphaeae, like this, Fiorinae, Siomensae, and Neneola, right? This just helped us uh, better identify those different species within the same genus. But, you know, uh, um, you know, why does this matter, right? Why do we need to know about the species? Uh, which species cause anthracnose? They're just anthracnose, right? Now, we're interested in understanding fungicide resistance because, you know, obviously we use fungicide to try to manage the disease. So we wanted to use some, uh, to use effective materials for the disease. Now, we tested uh, resistance of those isolates to strawberry ruin fungicide. FRAC11, which is the primary chemical group for strawberry anthracnose, right? Like a pristine, a bond, uh, things like that. And we found that 71 isolates out of uh, 178 uh, lymphae, uh, they were resistant, right? And the five, additional five isolates were found to be moderately resistant. With regard to Fiorinae, under the same species complex, they're 100%. Eight of them, all of them were moderately resistant to strobilurins. Uh, with regard to Gallodiosporides, um, Siomensi, all of them were resistant to strobilurins. So, and then we also tested um, for resistance to Topsin M, which is a FRAC1 chemical group. And um, the Accutatin complex, uh, this complex is naturally resistant to Topsin M, so we did not included that one for resistance detection to topsin M. And we only, we only did that with Cototrichin gallodiosporides. And out of 11 high isolates, seven were found to be resistant to topsin M. So again, all fiorini isolates were resistant to QI strobilurins. And the overall resistance frequency was um, 60, more than 60% for siphonomethyl in Cototrichin gallodiosporides. That was often found to be associated with uh, strawberry crown rot, right? And this uh, map, um, you see those circles filled with black color indicate resistance, okay? And those indicate where we uh, sampled those isolates, get, get those isolates from. And you can say that the resistance is really widespread 
in our region. Okay, I want to make a summary before uh, we move on to other things. So far, we have found uh, four different colhotrin species uh, from strawberry anthracolose, and the majority of the isolates from the fruit was found to be colhotrin nymphaeae. And nymphaeae and the were also frequently isolated from the crown, indicating that they're responsible for the crown rot, anthracolose crown rot. And Cotogen feorini, uh, we only got five isolates, uh, not many, and they were only found uh, from the fruit with uh, relatively, I mean, very low occur occurrence, say 5%, right? And Xiomense, that's under um, Cotogen gallodiosporidis complex, was found, uh, first found in our region, and the lineola was not described as a cause of strawberry anthracnose before. So, Again, resistance to both strobulurins, uh, FRAC11, that's QI, and the uh, MBC, top M, FRAC1 group in cotogen species is widespread. And, um, and uh, we found those resistant isolates from um, different plant tissues, different host tissues, runner, stem, crown, fruit as well. Okay. Are there any anthracnose resistant cultivars? I know you'll grow um, probably mostly Chandler, right? Chandler is highly susceptible to anthracnose. But are there any resistant cultivars? I mean, very few are known to be resistant to the crown rot, right? And the sun cultivars may be more susceptible to fruit rot, like Chandler, Albion, Camarosa, and those ones are really associated with anthracnose. And cultivars growing in our region have not really been um, fully understand uh, regarding their susceptibility to anthracolose in general. And this figure just show, uh, shows that um, what cultivars, you know, cultivars from which our isolates obtained, were obtained. And you can say we got our isolates mostly from Chandler, followed by Camarosa, Early Glow, Albion, but this does not really indicate the, the plant, um, the cultivar susceptibility, because the planting size of those cultivars are different, right? The chandler that we probably, uh, is much more popular than other cultivars. Um, but just give you an idea, where do we get our, our, did we get our isolates? Now, getting back to the species, um, again, why they matter? Um, well, Cotogen acutatin, now we know we got two different species, uh, Lymphaea and the Fiorini, and uh, resistant to FRAC11, Strobiluens was found in both species. And uh, Lota will say that this complex inherently naturally resistant to FRAC1, to um, Topsin M. And then Cotogen gallodiosporides, so we found Cotogen Siomensi, and also found resistance in Siomensi to both FRAC1 and the FRAC11, okay? Now, you may wonder what are other possible, you know, um, materials that we could use to manage anthracolose. Those are the common um, major chemical classes, groups of fungicide currently labeled for strawberry production. FRAC1, well, we found a resistance, we had a resistance issue, right? Then FRAC2, uh, Rovera, Iprodion. And that one you're only supposed to use prior to bloom, bloom once per season, once in a season. It's not gonna work for anthracolose. FRAC11, resistance issue, widespread. Uh, what about FRAC12? FRAC12 is effective switch. Uh, it's re very good material for botrytis and we found that it's also very good for um, anth anthracolose, for cotogen as well. But you need more than that, right? For resistance management, you're told to rotate um, different chemicals with different modes of action for better resistance management, but what other materials uh, that you could uh, um, use for your rotational program? Well, uh, FRAC3 um, is mainly used for strawberry powdery mildew, right? If you have powdery mildew issue, you might use FRAC3, but nothing else really. Uh, FRAC7, some of them are, are really good for botrytis, uh, maybe powder mildew to some extent. But what's interesting is that there have been uh, newer development of those materials within each chemical group. So we're wondering about, um, you know, um, different products 
within those two groups, whether some of them could be useful for strawberry anthracnose management. And so we started with um, uh, DMI fungicide FRAX3. Um, um, those are the active ingredients. Most of them are labeled for strawberry, except for the last one, Menfen trifluconazole. That's the latest BASF product, okay? And we tested the EC50 of those species that we found from strawberries to those different active ingredients all belong to FRAC3, DMI fungicides. And you can say that um, there, it's pretty interesting that there is a differential sensitivity of those um, different species to some of those DMI materials. And in other words, it, the intrinsic activity uh, between those DMI materials seem to be uh, somewhat different. But uh, it's a little worth saying that the first one, the first guy here, Defenconazole, and the fourth guy, uh, Propiconazole. The bar, the higher the bars are, the less effective the fungicide uh, uh, would be. So you can say that both Defenconazole and the Propiconazole work the best among the DMI fungicide that we tested across the board. Okay, and then we further, uh, we confirmed this with detached fruit assays where we select the propiconazole, where we think that uh, it might be uh, effective against anthracnose, along with a few others that don't seem to be very good for anthracnose based on the EC50 values. And if you, and we'll do, we also included a switch, uh, as I mentioned before, switch uh, is pretty good for anthracnose, and you can say the leaching diameter. So what we did was that we inoculated those um, uh, berries with um, the cortotrican nymphaea and treated those berries with different uh, fungicides. So then we wait for a few days to measure the leaching, the disease leaching. And you can say the switch really was the best and there was no uh, leaching developed on those berries treated with switch, followed by propiconazole, right? And indicating that propiconazole does seem to have uh, some efficacy for anthracnose and it could be used uh, for your spray program, right? Okay, um, how about FRAC7? FRAC7 material, I mean, right now it's very popular, right? SDHI fungicides. Um, now, cototrin gallodial spread is cototrin acutate, and here we don't really separate them by their sort of a subspecies, but in general, gallodial spread is acutate and we tested different um, FRAC7 materials, including Boscale fluoxide pyroxide. Um, the first one, that's pristine fluoxide pyroxide, that's Marivon, Pensopyra, that's uh, Fantalis. The fourth one, Flupyrin, and that's, that can be found in Lula sensation, Lula triquinity, right? And the last one, um, Benzovin, um, that's, that's not, unfortunately, not labeled for strawberry, Aprovia, or Aprovia top, okay? Now, again, the higher the numbers are, the less effective the fungicide would be. Uh, for example, Boscale, Fluoxide, Pyroxide, you know those ones are not going to work for anthracnose. But those smaller numbers, uh, especially the last one, unfortunately not labeled for strawberry. But this one, Pensopyrid, Fantalis, could also be useful for strawberry anthracnose management. Okay? Um, there is a newer material called uh, uh, Zevian. It's, uh, it has not really, it's been on the market for, for a while, mainly for food industry, not for, um, for fruit, uh, vegetable. But anyway, um, right now this material, um, I think it was labeled uh, for anthracnose as a pre-dip, pre-plant um, pre dip material. Two years ago, it was labeled um, in Florida, California, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, unfortunately not in Maryland, okay? And this is a sort of a UV unstable. That's why it's recommended to use this material as a pre-plant dip. And they've done some trials uh, to compare the efficacy of Zevian with Switch and Abang. You can say that in general, uh, Zevian is comparable to Switch for anthracnose. In, in this case, anthracnose crown rot, okay? As a um, pre-plant dip material. If you grow, I mean, highly susceptible cultivars, not for our growers, but like the growers in Virginia, they might consider this. And the, then you would uh, expect to reduce the inoculant 
potentially exist in transplants, right? And save other materials for later in the season. Take home message here, uh, we found resistance to FRAC11, uh, strawberry lurens, and FRAC1, and that was common. And so continued use of those fungicides may no longer, you know, may not be effective for anthracose management. Captain, I did not mention this, it is effective against anthracose, okay? And should be um, included in every sprays during fruit ripening when the disease pressure tends to be high, okay? It's a warm and a wet disease. During fruit ripening process, the temperature gets warmer and warmer, sugar level rises. So captain is important to be included in every spray uh, of your, you know, uh, spray program, every sprays during later part in the season for resistance and for the disease management. It's a multi site fungicide, does not have, is not prone to resistance development, okay? Uh, certain DMIs, certain uh, uh, FRAC3 materials, not all FRAC3 materials, right? Um, example would be tilt and quadris top. Tilt, that's poppyconazole. Quadris top, that has a defenconazole. So both defenconazole, poppyconazole seem to be effective based on our uh, work. And the fontalis could also be useful. And those ones, you can consider uh, rotating them, right? And with a switch and tank mixing with a captain. And, um, you know, hopefully you can um, manage anthracos throughout the season. But it's a water, water dispersal passaging, right? Any practices that can keep water off the plant will be of great, great benefit. Some growers might use tunnels, low tunnels, right? That could uh, benefit from, um, that could be good for anthracose management. Okay, moving on to botrytis. Now, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with botrytis. It's, um, it's also very important fungal passaging um, on strawberries. And they can also cause crown rot, right? The, not not the, the inside the crown, it's just the crown area. And typically, you know, the strawberry crown rot occur early in the season. Um, but primarily, it's a fruit rot passaging. Now, we talk a lot about species. What about species that responsible for strawberry botrytis, gray mold, right? There are actually uh, also multiple different species responsible for um, strawberry botrytis. The, the first one, botrytis scenario, that's a very classic, uh, a classic fungal passage, very popular, right? Very important, the causal agent of strawberry gray mold. But we also um, discovered that there is a new, uh, ra relatively new species, botrytis, not called botrytis, sorry, botrytis figariae, and um, also can cause botrytis on strawberries in the country, in the states, okay? Other species, um, very minor. I mean, one person, mighty, 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 mighty. So, they did a study a couple of years ago, survey um, to identify botrytis species from strawberries in different states, including Maryland. And you can say that uh, this is the distribution, the frequency of those isolates. Uh, the black, that's uh, Botrytis scenario, uh, while the white bar indicates Botrytis figariae. And both species were found in one, two, three, four, five different states examined, right? And figariae as a relatively new species were found to be pretty widespread in the southeast. And this, I mean, they also do look differently. And the uh, Botrytis scenario, it's more sort of a, has more uh, aerial mycelia, whereas Botrytis figariae seem to be more compact, dense. And they did a uh, pathology, pathogenicity assay on strawberry and other host tissues. And you can say that here, Botrytis figariae, right, Botrytis scenario, when they inoculate the strawberry flowers, uh, it's, it's too small to say, but I just, uh, I'm just going to expand this to you. So, um, Figari actually seem to be even more uh, slightly aggressive compared to Scenari on flowers. And, but with regard to fruit infection, uh, Scenari seem to be more, it's already around, Scenari seem to be more aggressive than Botrytis Figari, okay? And on long strawberry tissues, Figari uh, was not 
able to cause lesions or just form very small lesions, indicating that this new species Figariae may have just adapt, adapted to strawberries only. And okay, this is the interesting part, fungicide sensitivity. The differential sensitivity or resistance in those two species. Uh, again, I mean the, oh, the white bar, that means sensitive, okay? The, um, the darker the color is, it more resistant, like uh, the black resistant, the gray uh, reduced sensitivity, and the darker gray moderate resistant. And then compare the sensitivity or frequency uh, resistance to each of those fungicides between the two species. First one, Figariae, Scenariae, right? To Boscati, FRAC7, where you say that Scenariae had more resistance issues compared to Figariae, and no resistance was found uh, in Figariae. The same here, FRAC7, Pensopyrad, right? No resistance was detected in Figariae. FRAC line, no resistance in Figariae. And then um, others, um, they're all, you know, resistance issues to some extent. So, okay, take home message. Resistance in botrytis isolates is common uh, to most of the chemicals that we have for strawberries. And newer FRAC7 materials, uh, Lula, Merivan, and FRAC12, and those ones, they seem to have uh, much less resistance issues at this point, okay? And thyroid or captain, um, both are multi-site fungicides, and they, they both have a pretty good efficacy for botrytis, especially uh, thyroid, and should be uh, the backbone of your spray programs. And perhaps targeting botrytis figariae more so than botrytis scenario at the bloom. And then, you know, as I showed, they have a somewhat different you know, fungicide resistance profiles between those two species. So fungicide choices could be tailored to such differences between their, you know, uh, resistance frequency. Moving on to Leopestotopsis, this is a um, relatively new uh, disease that caused major issues in Florida. And um, my colleague, Dr. Natalia Press at the University of Florida mentioned that uh, there were five farms in uh, 2018-19 season uh, that had the issue and they all got transplants from one specific nursery in North Carolina. And then the second year, more farms, 20 farms in Florida, and they all got the plants from two sites, but still from the same nursery in um, North Carolina. And then it gets worse. It got worse in, uh, in the following year and uh, last year, it was not as bad as the previous year, but weather could have been a factor, right? So uh, it's just like anthracnose. It goes onto the fruit. Um, it also can cause the crown rot. This very de devastating disease down there in Florida. And it, I mean, the, this is what looks like uh, when it infects the strawberry leaf. Rapid, rapid progression during wet conditions. It's also a warm and wet disease, okay? And you can oftentimes observe the black pycnidia in the center of the lesion. The lesion progress really fast. And, and sometimes, you know, this simultan is uh, somewhat confused with other traditional um, leaf issues, um, uh, foliage issues. So cultural controls, um, well, you don't, you wanna, you don't wanna take the chance, right? Try to avoid introducing the disease in the first place. And then, um, you know, if you, you find this disease, you want to do some sanitation, remove those infected uh, plants or leaves um, under dry conditions and work in the less affected area uh, first to avoid such spread. With regard to chemical choices, they did um, some efficacy trials that showed thyroid, switch, or mirror of prime. Those ones are the, the best among those fungicide tested for the disease control. But these are not completely effective, okay? It only gives you about, gives you about 40% control efficacy, and so you likely will have to spray more frequently in order to, to manage the disease. Omega, Bravo, those are even more effective than siren or switch, 
But unfortunately, you know, Bravo is labeled for nurseries, and Omega currently in the in the registration process, but also it's just gonna be um, available for nurseries, not for <coughs> fruit producers. And I think Chris helping uh, with this. We uh, we planted uh, some some plants from a nursery. And those plants, when they came in, they had tons of infections of uh, uh, Neopastotopsis. And we, uh, we planted them in a sort of isolated area. It was a small um, isolated area, a small plot, different cultivars, um, a few California day neutrals, uh, Juneberry Chandler, and Sweet Charlie. And this is what you know, they looked like when they came in. It was really bad. And then, um, uh, soon after planting, uh, this it was, okay, this was March. Yeah, so uh, right after planting, I mean within two weeks, most of those plants died, okay, declined. Uh, but for, for plants that survive through the winter, and this, those pictures were taken in the following spring, and you can say they come out pretty well. And uh, some, most of them are uh, sweet hardy. And sweet hardy seem to have somewhat resistance to this, um, to this disease. And this, uh, to us, you know, indicate, indicates that this passage may not really overwinter very well in our climate, okay? Or it could be, you know, the, the weather climate, weather condition last year was not favorable for the disease. But anyhow, so far we have not observed um, fruit rot caused by this passaging in our region, including Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, Jersey. However, we did have a, a few fields that had issues with this disease after planting during fall. So to me, this could be an issue uh, with transplants. And under right conditions during fall, um, it could become a big issue, all right? But after the winter, going through the winter, uh, we just haven't found the fruit rot caused by the disease yet. Now moving on to Phytophthora crown rot. The, the passaging, there are multiple uh, Phytophthora, uh, Phytophthora species um, associated with this disease as well. Uh, most commonly Phytophthora cacatorum. And nursery, again, um, nursery stock has been considered one of the, you know, the major um, source uh, for the inoculant. Uh, in addition, irrigation water, I mean, it's a waterborne, waterborne passaging, right? Irrigation water surviving the soil from previous season could also contribute to the disease infection and the development. So fungicides are, are the main, you know, uh, tool that we use for Phytophthora. Of course, there are cultivars that are more um, tolerant to this disease. But if you have the issue, then you uh, likely will end up using some fungicides and uh, most commonly, I mean, this one, FRAC4, uh, red milk gold, and this is uh, commonly used for phytophthora control. And it was done through drip application, right? But resistance is a concern. I will get to that later. And there is a new material called Arundis gold, and it's a combination of uh, red milk plus forty line. It's uh, two different chemicals that make together, a premixture, okay? And trials, fungicide trials conducted in other places that show uh, this new material is as, as effective as uh, red milk gold, okay? However, I do want to point out that the other component, 49, FRAC 49, also has efficacy for Phytophthora. If there is a resistance issue to FRAC 4, and this one around this gold might be a better choice, okay? And uh, phosphites, such as uh, uh, phosphorol um, uh, allier as well. And those ones, um, they, also, they also offer some efficacy for phytophthora control. And they can also uh, be used as a pre-plant dip material. Uh, you may consider this again if you grow um, highly susceptible cultivars. They can also be um, uh, made through foliar applications. Again, you know, not very, not as effective as the other two, but we have not confirmed any resistance issues with, um, with this group yet. So less resistance risk. 
So Redmio, speaking of Redmio, that's the, uh, the major tool that we have for Phytophthora and it was the resistance was first detected in Cactoran isolates from a strawberry field in South Carolina. That was about, that was 15 years ago, okay. And recently there was a shift towards higher frequency of resistance in Phytophthora and Cactoran population in Florida. And the bond, uh, QI strawberry ruin fungicide, this one is labeled for laser rot. Laser rot on the fruit, not caused by the same pathogen, uh, Cactoran. And uh, there is another uh, species, uh, Phytophthora nicotiana, or can also cause um, laser rot. But resistance has been detected to strawberry ruins in both of these two species in Florida. <coughs> Phosphi, again, um, they have much lower risk for resistance development. Okay. This is, I think, a possible spray program that I would recommend. Um, I mentioned the, the potential, you know, the different resistance profiles of the two Botrytis species. So at the bloom, uh, Botrytis figaria seemed to be a major concern than Botrytis scenario. Then we could take advantage that figaria so far has not we have not found the resistance to any of those SDHI materials yet, right? Perhaps using those SDHIs at the bloom could be a better strategy. And then we safe switch for later in the season, targeting more or so for Botrytis scenario, which is a major concern on fruit rot, for fruit rot. And again, Thyron, Thyron or Captain, this uh, could be your backbone of your spray program because they are effective against um, two major diseases, Botrytis and Anthracnose in general. Early in the season, uh, you might consider Thyron because it, it can be um, useful for deer management. I was told that it can sort of, uh, you know, deer done, I get. And it also has a higher efficacy towards Botrytis, which tend to be a major concern early part of the season. And Captain, um, on the other side is more effective against anthracolose and you can use that later in the season when anthracolose issue, you know, is getting, uh, the disease pressure is higher. Um, I didn't mention this, but we've done trial um, that, you know, with, uh, with PhD, that's a soft material, polio X and D, that's an ingredient of PhD. Uh, zero day PHI for our re-entry interval and has pretty good efficacy for botrytis. So if you open your field for you pick or something like that, then this could be a better choice later in the season close to harvest or during harvest. Anyway, I think that's it. And uh, this year uh, we are accepting strawberry gray mold samples for fungicide resistance detection. So if you're, you're interested in finding out, uh, finding out your potential resistance issues in your strawberry botrytis samples, you're more than welcome to send Dead flowers like the picture shown, uh, like this, or those, uh, those dead leaves and uh, where we most likely um, gonna get Botrytis out. If you send me healthy samples, um, I, I, I may not be able to get Botrytis out. But if you send me dead flowers, uh, like with black centers, okay, like a black eye, most likely killed by frost damage early in the season. And that's when, uh, where we most likely gonna get Botrytis out. And then we test for resistance to different fungicides that you commonly used. So we, we should be able to get the results back to you in 10 days or so, uh, if not sooner. Hopefully you will be able to use that information to adjust your spray program. That's all I have for today. Be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, okay. When you talk about transplants, what uh, that would be be the plugs or what about bare root plants that you get from a you know, Botrytis or um, talking about Botrytis or anthracnose? Okay. Uh, you, bare root plants, I'm sorry, what was your question? Uh, uh, well, the question is do these diseases uh, seem, seem less prevalent in bare root plants? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think bare root plants, of course, I mean obviously they also got those t diseases. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I heard that because, you know, anthracolose, I mean, that's a good question, right? Anthracolose, um, the transplants, I mean, the plug plants, right? 
somehow maybe have more concerns in terms of anthracnose. Bare root plants, I think, might be safer uh, for anthracnose. The I've done both, my, uh, it must be much more. The bare root uh, did great. Correct. Not. Correct. And, but I did find in the bare root, I did, uh, I've done like seven different the, plants. Yeah. The sandworm was the worst. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, you know, in terms of a plug production, right, the nursery, when they make propagate uh, plug plants, it's like a constant misting and a warm condition in the greenhouse. So it really creates a perfect condition for, uh, for anthracnose to take off. I think that contributes you know, to the fact that why transplants them to, you know, plug plants them to have higher level of anthracnose than bare roots. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.